Dear Brothers, I appreciate your February 21, 2000 reply in consideration of my letters dated February 16, 1998, July 31, 1998, and November 15, 1999, together with your previous replies dated March 23, 1998, and August 24, 1998. However, I fear that you brothers do not understand the full measure, indeed specific requests, of my concern. For this reason and fearing that others carefully considering our stance on blood may realize similar difficulties, I will make one more attempt to spell out more exactly those difficulties. Before doing so as follows, let me first ease your minds about concerns raised in your February 21st, 2000 response. I am not seeking to impose anything on anyone. Indeed, I try hard to avoid such. Nor am I inclined to do so. At this point, I am not sure I could impose anything regarding medical use of blood components, because I am unable to do so, which is part of my problem. For example, if a local friend chose to accept white corpuscles to bolster their immune system, then as an elder, I would be expected to impose our stance which prohibits acceptance of white corpuscles, since I cannot explain scripturally the distinctions of our stance, I could not impose that stance. I would be forced to recuse myself as incompetent to hear the case. I am not seeking ways of convincing everyone that we are correct. Such is unrealistic and contrary to Jesus' utterance that most are on the road to destruction. Regarding physicians or anyone else, I am not looking for ways of absorbing implicit demands, but rather gaining needed conviction for teaching, whether that be to physicians, my family, congregation publishers, or anyone else. I am not seeking scriptural clarifications regarding a new teaching, but rather one that has existed for decades. Your letter of February 21st, 2000 wisely admonishes that each of us should have or gain the waiting attitude of Micah, Regarding that attitude, as you noted the watchtower of January 1st, 2000, on page 10 makes the following comment. If a Christian does not fully understand a new explanation of a scripture, he does well humbly to echo the words of the prophet Micah, I will show a waiting attitude for the God of my salvation. That comment is regarding how we should deal personally with new views, not how we explain views long held. My questions are not concerning something new, but rather views held for decades. Is it unreasonable to request clarification of reasons? Views offered regarding teachings decades old? Is it unreasonable that someone asked to teach asks for an understanding of the reasons behind the answers? Or the scriptural reasons for the explanations? My concerns have existed for some time now. They are not new or short-lived. I have asked you for scriptural clarifications. I have also waited, allowing time for your thorough consideration of my request. Regarding new views, we usually do give corresponding scriptural reasons for them. Whether we understand or not has more to do with our understanding of those scriptural reasons, not just a new idea itself. In this case, our stance is pretty clear. Though I think dynamic details and their consequences are very much missed by many including many of our brothers. What I have asked is for corresponding scriptural explanations regarding certain pertinent details of our stance. Now, to clarifying issues of concern. Our stance on medical use of blood makes distinctions between components of blood. Naturally, the question arises, if we tolerate intentional acceptance of one component of blood, then why forbid intentional acceptance of other components of blood? Since we represent our stance as scriptural, in order to adequately defend distinctions, made we must provide scriptural reasons for them, otherwise distinctions made become indefensible either way, the tolerance or the intolerance. Our literature and your previous replies indicate one possible scriptural distinction and one possible distinction as a matter of reasonableness. The one possible scriptural distinction is the element of nutrition. That is whether a blood component provides nutrition versus utilizing other mechanisms, thereby immunizing the body from a certain disease. 
However, as previously expressed, there are terrible flaws regarding the distinction of nutrition. Itemized below are three flaws in that distinction, two of which I enumerated earlier, plus an additional one. 1. Components considered a matter of conscience are nutrition to the body, thus saying that nutrition is the distinction is indefensible. 2. Confounding the distinction of nutrition is the following paragraph from Insight, on the Scriptures, Volume 1, page 629, under the heading Disease and Treatment. However, if a person were to take blood into his body for the treatment of disease, this would violate the law of God. Clearly, that comment above has to do with effects of blood other than nutrition. Specifically, that comment is contrary to the notion that utilizing components of blood for immunizing the body from a certain disease is okay, which confounds the nutrition distinction. 3. Confusing the distinction of nutrition is our published comments comparing the significant transfer from mother to fetus via the placenta. See questions from readers. The Watchtower of June 1, 1990, page 31, paragraphs 11 through 14. Since a fetus gains every bit of its nutrition from its mother's blood via the placenta, then our use of that as an example, again, goes contrary to the distinction of nutrition. The offered scriptural distinction as a matter of reasonableness has to do with whether we should consider parts of a substance the same as the whole such a distinction must be somehow defined, such as by uniqueness, size, amount, common recognition, etc. Even then, since our stance is represented as scriptural, we must show scripturally that our distinction is proper. For example, we could never say that reasonably certain minor aspects components of pornea are tolerable because without exception, the Bible says abstain from fornication. However, as itemized below, there are at least three terrible flaws regarding the idea of distinctions based upon reasonableness. 1. Components considered a matter of conscience are just as unique to blood as forbidden components. Thus, no reasonable distinction can be made based upon uniqueness. For example, white corpuscles are as unique to blood as clotting factors. Also, classifying components of blood as major or minor components is meaningless unless major and minor is effectively defined. 2. Consistently components considered a matter of conscience do not make up less of blood by volume. Thus, no reasonable distinction can be made based upon size or amount. For example, forbidden white corpuscles makes up less volume of blood than tolerated albumin. 3. Medical practitioners commonly refer to red corpuscles white corpuscles, platelets, and plasma as components of blood. Taking the stance that abstain from blood applies to medical transfusion then. The Bible offers no proper exceptions from abstaining from blood based upon components. In that case, the phrase abstain from blood is just as categorical as abstain from fornication, pornea. There is no indication in Scripture that God commonly recognizes one component of blood as more or less unique important or common than another component. Designations and divisions of red corpuscles. White corpuscles, platelets, and plasma are purely man-made. Modern medicine divides, recognizes, and names components of blood as they discover and understand them. God has recognized from the beginning the various components of blood and their purpose. Thus, no reasonable distinction can be made based upon common recognition. Additionally, our stance on blood exhibits certain other contradictions, inconsistencies that appear indefensible. For example, 1. The contradiction of our utilizing donated and stored blood, while simultaneously condemning the donation and storage of blood for medical use. 2. Saying that we abstain from blood, when in fact our stance tolerates acceptance of some components of blood, physicians or anyone else can simply say Jehovah's Witnesses abstain from some parts of blood and but not all parts of blood. In your February 21st, 2000 reply, you stated, My concern is why the accepting of some fractions of blood for medical treatment has been left as a matter of conscience. Actually, 
Regarding fractions, more accurately, my concern is why is accepting certain fractions considered a matter of conscience, while acceptance of other fractions is not considered a matter of conscience. I see no such distinction that can be made scripturally in my specific concerns, detailed above, are not addressed in your February 21st, 2000 response. Like other brothers, I'm able to tell our stance on medical use of blood and direct interested persons to where our publications address it. Afterward, as you say, each must decide for themselves, uncoerced, according to their conscience. But what I am interested in is having scriptural answers to critical aspects of our position. Such answers allow that I can teach, and that with conviction, rather than just tell, Teaching with conviction requires knowing and understanding the reasons for answers or explanations. In this case, scriptural reasons for a scriptural stance. My difficulty is with explaining and teaching our published scriptural stance with scriptures and sound reasoning, not informing persons what our stance is. I fear now that my concerns and questions raised about our present stance have no scriptural answers. If they existed, I feel you brothers would have already shared them with me. This is very disheartening. Nevertheless, I will do my level best in serving Jehovah and trust that you brothers will continue pondering issues raised toward resolution. In the meantime, if issues such as those expressed are raised to me, I will show persons where our publications address them. If pressed for scriptural answers to issues about which I have questions myself, then I must honestly reply that I do not know them. In some instances, I may have to decline being used. In my November 15, 1999 letter, I stated while patiently awaiting answers to my questions, I have continued to pray and ponder over our stance of tolerance towards some blood components and intolerance toward other blood components as well as our overall teaching regarding medical infusion of blood. That pondering has included the idea that maybe my questions are irrelevant, because perhaps our stance requires more than intended based upon scriptures, that perhaps abstain from blood does not address medical blood transfusion as we know it today, thus mooting my questions. So, regarding our overall teaching about medical infusion of blood, versus the decree to abstain from blood and in harmony with admonitions in the Watchtower of June 1, 1982, page 20. Paragraph 15, I submit a suggestion for an improved view of the decree to abstain from blood. My suggestion is the result of long, hard, intense, and sometimes distressful and prayerful consideration. I expect no response to it. I only submit it for your consideration. I assure you, that my suggestion has only the loftiest of intentions to better understand, respect, and obey our Father, Jehovah, and His requirements. My motivation is genuine and not at all toward seeking ways of diluting God's express will. Seeking to dilute God's word is counterproductive toward pleasing our Maker and gaining His rich rewards. If you have any questions or wish to communicate regarding it, you should feel free to do so. But again, I have no need for a reply to it. I believe that my suggested view is already fundamentally realized in our publications yet, without elaboration, as they apply to the decree abstain from blood, versus medical transfusion of blood as practiced today. I must admit that though I have always enjoyed reading and studying the Bible, along with vigorously researching our publications, that I had to dig harder and deeper than ever to realize what turned out to be simple elements as presented in my suggested improved view. My suggestion is enclosed as a separate document. Though somewhat long, it contains basic and simple elements strongly favoring the view presented. Finally, I know this is now my fourth letter to you brothers, on the same subject of blood and upholding righteous standards. I am reminded of Abraham's questioning toward that one, whom Jehovah was using. I hope you brothers will not chaff, but rather that you will see a way to clarify my inquiries if possible. If need be, I am more than willing to travel and meet you in person, face to face, so that with a full measure, my questions, responses, or suggestions can be understood 
and put to rest or to the test. I want to express my appreciation to you brothers for responding at all to my letters regarding blood and upholding righteous standards. As I said earlier, considering the nature of my questions, I really had no one else to turn for dialogue. I realize that my letters have been somewhat long and tedious, but that is the nature of corresponding by letter on such subjects as this, which I have tried to address objectively toward better understanding God's will. Again, I appreciate your time and responding. Please be assured of my love and respect for you and accept my appreciation for all your hard work in behalf of our neighbors, our brothers, my family, and myself. Your fellow servant of Jehovah, R. Jensen. We'll end this video here. What do you think will be contained in his suggested view of the command to abstain from blood? I'll share that in the next video.